hello, my name is Michael Williamson, and I am part of art team at the Barnes Foundation. And today I'd like to focus on the ballet door that is uh, from the ballet people of West Africa. Uh, it's my goal in this discussion uh, to examine the ballet door in the context of the Barnes Foundation, not only as an aesthetic object, but also as an expression of a cultural and spiritual life of the ballet people of West Africa. The door had great significance to Dr. Barnes as an object of aesthetic beauty, as an object imbued with power and mystery. In his writings from the 1920s, when he first acquired the bulk of his African sculpture uh, from the French dealer Paul Guillaume, he envisioned ancient Negro sculpture as vital cultural currency for the American New Negro to claim pride of place alongside equal in artistry to the art of Europe. The idea of equality among the races in political, artistic, and cultural contexts in the 1920s America was a stance that Dr. Barnes boldly staked his reputation on as a collector and as a largely self-taught art scholar. He engaged the great African-American minds of the day to join him in extolling the value of ancient Negro sculpture Alain Locke, who is a fellow uh, Central High School graduate, Harvard-educated Rhodes Scholar, and writer of the manifesto The Legacy of Ancestral Arts, the sociologist Charles Johnson, who went on to become the first Black president of uh, Fisk University, and Arthur Fawcett, another high uh, Central High School graduate, a revered public school teacher, folklorist, and anthropologist. Dr. Barnes intended, quote, to have the best private collection of Negro sculpture in the world. Dr. Barnes saw in ancient Negro sculpture bold form, syncopated rhythms, and uniting harmonies that he felt were also intrinsic to the American Negro spirituals he loved so much. Often during the early years of the Barnes Foundation, Dr. Barnes would host musical recitals of Negro spirituals in uh, the main gallery. Now, in close reading of Dr. Barnes' writing from the 1920s regarding African sculpture, we see both his revolutionary vision and the limitations of his somewhat a romanticized view of African art. Both Dr. Paul, Dr. Barnes and Paul Guillaume placed most of the African sculpture uh, in the collection with the dates that range from before the 10th century through the 15th century. We now know that much of the African sculpture dates from the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, on the May 1926 cover of Opportunity, Journal of Negro uh, Life, the ballet door has the grandiose title, Temple Door of the 16th Century. In African Art in the Barnes Foundation, Susan Mullen Vogel describes it simply as a door from inner room. Uh, I found that it is typical of a granary door. So it's really important to sort of take a look at the scale of the African continent and see it in context uh, so that uh, we have a, an idea of sort of the people and the cultures that created these objects. I would really describe the door more as a reliquary, which is sort of a religious object, uh, a spiritual object, rather than a work of art. The ballet people don't really have or didn't have a concept of what art would be. Uh, everything they made um, was related to nature. In this slide, you can see on the left, Coute d'Ivoire, and then you can see within on the right, on the right side uh, where uh, the various ethnic groups uh, uh, lived. And of course, you can't really look at Africa without examining colonialism and the uh, socio-political divisions that were arbitrary. So there were gr various groups of people who normally wouldn't be together, but because of the um, creation of uh, uh, countries uh, that they were kind of put together. So here is an example of uh, some granary doors uh, grain and, and, and granaries. A granary would have hold uh, sorghum, which is kind of a, a grain. It's almost like, a, it's a little bit like um, couscous. And uh, they're made out of clay and they have uh, roofs that are made of, um, of straw. The work of building the granaries is uh, shared by men and women, but much of the work is gendered. The men gather the wood, they build the wood superstructure, and then the women do the mud brick uh, construction. 
And this is obviously in current times, uh, so this is for demonstration purposes. And it's think of it as making a very large pinch pot. And you can see here the placement of a, a door within the context of the structure. And the door here is plywood, and the wood's probably bought from Home Depot, as are the um, lock and the uh, hinges. But these all would have been um, constructed from wood. And here's an example of a granary with a granary door that has been carved. And this is obviously an older granary. Uh, you can see how it functions in the context of the village. And I had the pleasure of traveling to South Africa and Botswana in the 1980s and building uh, some houses. And this is uh, from my sketchbook. And so here we get our ballet door. Uh, it's on the second floor of the Barnes Foundation opposite uh, Matisse's Bonaire de Vivre. And of course, here's a photograph of Paul Guillaume. Paul Guillaume came from humble beginnings. He um, was a working as a clerk in an auto repair shop. And the objects, uh, the African sculpture, were um, actually included in large crates of rubber that came rubber for tires. And uh, he saw these objects, was really, uh, really mesmerized by them, placed them in the window of a shop, and then artists like Matisse, Vlaminck, uh, Brock, Picasso saw the sculpture and then Paul Guillaume opened his own small gallery and included the early moderns. Um, and we then sort of, this is how kind of, kind of early modernist artists are influenced by African sculpture. So at our door is really an extraordinary door because it's carved on both sides, which is really unusual. So on, um, on this side, uh, you can see a crocodile at the bottom, uh, a mask sort of in the center, and then two waterfowl at the top. The door is about 54 inches high by about 20 inches wide, and it's on its own carved stand. And you can see at the bottom on the left, a little pin and a pin at the top of wood, and that would have fit into the wall of the uh, granary. Uh, the crocodile uh, is seen, it seems, from an aerial point of view, which is very typical, but also you can see that line of bilateral symmetry that also could be seen as two crocodiles, uh, sort of almost like back to back. So that's really quite interesting. And then above that uh, is a mask, and that mask is reminiscent of the uh, spirit wives that men would carve of women uh, for their strength, from their beauty, from their intelligence, and for their wisdom. And then above that, waterfowl. So the idea that the theme here is water is related in many ways to the original creation myth of the Baule people. In fact, uh, the, pre, the queen uh, Ablupoka, when she needed to move her people from what is present day Ghana to uh, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, she had to cross the Kamoe River with her people. Uh, the water was rushing, they had no way to get across, and so she made a sacrifice. And the sacrifice was her only son. So the word baule is actually two words, and it means uh, the son is dead. So she had to make this enormous sacrifice. Uh, so the water theme here seems to relate to that original uh, creation myth. And on the reverse side uh, is a grid. The grid uh, is red iron oxide, the dark parts, and the white parts are kaolin, uh, which is a sort of white clay, it's the basis of porcelain. Both of these things could be easily dug up uh, in, near a river. And you can see that in the center, there's a square that is kind of looks like offering. It's a square within a square within a square and a hole. That hole corresponds also to the hole underneath on the other side uh, where the mask of the woman uh, is. And that hole was likely the place where either a leather or raffia uh, handle would have been placed to be able to open the door. The uh, idea of the grid represents duality, dark, light, male, female, uh, good, bad, that kind of thing. Uh, one of the things I did is compared our door with other doors. So the ballet door from the Brooklyn Museum has a grid pattern, but that grid is shifted so that it's kind of a 
triangles like a harlequin pattern and that is to symbolize uh increase uh re re represented by frogs the idea of fertility and i can also see that that crocodile is quite thin so we can get a sense of how unusual our crocodile is uh, from looking at some of the other doors and from the ballet door from the metropolitan museum uh, it has a pin lock which represents the unity of male and female and then it has the same uh almost exactly the same image of the, um, of the woman, uh, the revered woman, the, uh, the spirit wife, but they're two spirit wife images. And what that often represents is twins. I found that in Nigeria, uh, it has uh, the highest number of uh, twin births in the world. Twins are seen as good luck. So we get to look at the original building of the Barnes Foundation we can see that the entry portico is uh, festooned with, um, with tile work, Enfield tiles. Dr. Barnes chose the ballet door symbol as well as other uh, imitations uh, in clay of the original uh, African sculpture as the entrance way to the Barnes Foundation. And then in the center, you can see the original sign for the Barnes Foundation. The ballet door is actually the uh, original uh, sort of marketing uh, kind of uh, symbol of the barns. So you can imagine in 1925 when people would walk in to see Impressionist, Post-Impressionist and Early Modern Art that the entranceway, they're greeted, they pass through African art as they uh, look at the rest of the collection. So uh, the architects who designed uh, the Parkway building uh, Billy Shen and Todd Williams uh, were tasked with uh, reinventing that relationship of African art to the collection. And they uh, talked about the idea of wrapping the building in a fabric of stone. And they were inspired by the rhythms and the patterns of kente cloth. As you enter into the light court, you can see on the floor a mosaic and that mosaic is uh, based on a drawing by Billy Shin, and it is uh, an interpretation of what's on the right, which is called a liar's cloth. So it's kente cloth that's been um, sewn together, and it would be something that a, um, a chief would wear when he needed to make uh, decisions, uh, sort of almost like a lawyer making decisions around who's telling the truth and who is lying. So it's literally a liar's cloth. Dr. Barnes uh, really uh, was enamored of this door. Uh, Dr. Barnes championed African-American culture. He was considered uh, uh, progressive in terms of race and class for his time period. He yearned for um, America to fully accept the new Negro of the Harlem Renaissance as an equal. He established the Barnes Foundation as an educational institution challenging the visual status quo in America and in Philadelphia. He was supremely confident in the transformative experience of art. I'm Tom Collins, Neubauer Family Executive Director of the Barnes Foundation. I hope you enjoyed Barnes Takeout. Subscribe and make sure your post notifications are on to get daily servings of art. Thanks for watching and for your support of the Barnes Foundation.